today we have a bright shining light in Jennifer Livingston who will bring us our encouragement. I know it's going to be an awesome, shining, love-filled, joyous experience this morning. So, Jennifer. Wow. Good morning, friends, and thank you, Vance, for that wonderful introduction. I'd like to add my own words of welcome to all of you, and very especially to those of you tuned into this love stream service here on Facebook Live. Welcome, and thank you, Vance, for setting this tone for this morning service. It is a beautiful Sunday morning service here at the Temple of Light Center for Spiritual Living in Kingston, Jamaica, and it is truly a joy for me to be sharing with you once again. This month, as mentioned earlier, March, marks the one year anniversary um, of the pandemic here in Jamaica, and so much has changed for us individually and all of us collectively. And here at the temple, we have learned to pivot. As we would say, wheel and come again. And my friends, you see, as Vance mentioned, today marks a very special occasion for us. Yes, it is Palm Sunday and all of Christendom is sharing in that celebration, and so are we here at the temple. But more importantly, this is the 53rd, I understand, so we have done 52nd, I'm sorry, please, the math and me, not so good. <laughs> but this is the 52nd live streaming of our Sunday morning service and we are, that we are hosting here on Facebook Live. And we want to recognize this wonderful achievement. Again, we gave an applause at the top, but we want to do it once more. You know, and while we would upload our Sunday morning service to YouTube at the end of service, and we still do, with the coming of the pandemic and the closing of churches, we had to find a way to get our service out to our members and friends on Sunday mornings. That's when a group of dedicated temple members got together to make this possible. Commendations and congratulations must be given to the members of the tech team, and I won't begin to calling out names as I don't want to leave anyone out, but they know who they are and they have stepped up to the plate and have been delivering every Sunday over the past year. Thank you, friends. So while we know we still have some way to go with our technology, we are delivering our messages to places far and wide that we were not able to reach before. And right here at home, our congregants who have not been able to come out to church even when we were allowed to have limited in-person attendance attendees, they have still been able to join us in our Sunday morning celebrations as you all are doing today. This coming together, even in the face of what may be seen as adversity, has led me to share with you these ideas for my talk this morning, which is titled, Performing Acts of Kindness connecting with our community. The world could use a little more kindness, especially with the year we have just had in 2020 and which has continued into this new year. It's pretty easy to get caught up in your own routine and everyday personal worries, and sometimes we just don't remember to tune in to those around us. Yet, every year, in the month of February, and this year was no different, in the USA, UK, and other countries around the world, Random Acts of Kindness Week was observed February 14th to 20th, with February 17th being celebrated as Random Acts of Kindness Day. This tradition started back in 1993 with the publication of a book by the same name, written by Anne Herbert, 
in which she shared true stories of kindness. I would like to share with you one such story from Reader's Digest, who this year asked readers to share first-hand accounts of compassion. And they shared with us 30 stories of kindness which touched their lives. I chose this one as I know many of us can relate to it. And it's titled, Kindness in Unexpected Places. Going to the post office is usually a weekly event for me. I rarely give it any thought other than to drive there, go inside, and drop off my letter or package. However, our world has changed, and now I must give careful consideration to this journey as my age and pre-existing condition put me into the vulnerable category. There are decisions that I need to make. Is this a package that must go out now? I conclude that it is. Is there anyone else who can take the package for me? I conclude there is not. So I have made two decisions already. Next, I must determine which of the two post offices closest to me would be the easiest one to accomplish my goal. I realize the larger one would be my best choice. Three decisions made. On the drive over, I determine that I will look to see the number of cars in the parking lot before I make my decision to go in. <clears throat> Unfortunately, I conclude upon arriving that the parking lot looks pretty empty, and so I pull into an empty parking space. My next thought is, perhaps I should wait for someone to come out and ask them to take my package in. Then I realize I will be making contact with a perfect stranger. And what is the difference between talking to that stranger and just going in and talking to the clerk? Next decision made, I walk inside. There are only two people and both are standing at the counters making their transactions. I walk to the front of what is normally a very long line. I am standing alone, waiting my turn. Shortly, I am called to the window. I can see that the postal clerk is aware of the fare in my eyes. She quietly steps back from her station and motions me to come forward. I step up to the counter and place my package on the scale. She then motions me to step back. I move away and she begins the process of weighing it and determining the proper postage. She tells me the price and motions me forward as she takes a step back. Again, I believe she saw the terror in my eyes and said, one moment, please. She leans onto the counter and picks up a Lysol wipe. She thoroughly cleans the credit card machine and the entire counter around it. She then steps back and again motions me forward. As I insert my card, tears start to roll down my cheeks. I was so moved by the care with which she accomplished that usually very simple task. When I had completed the transaction, she again motioned me back as she stepped forward. She took the receipt, wiped it down, and laid it on the counter. Beside it, she placed a clean tissue as she could see my tears were still streaming down my cheeks. She again stepped away from the counter. I picked up the receipt and took a step back. In gratitude, I bowed to her she bowed to me with equal respect. And that is a story from Jean Hall of Nashville, Tennessee. My friends, now more than ever, we each have the opportunity to support members of our communities 
both our church community and the communities in which we work or study or live, we can begin by being more kind and considerate towards our neighbors. By performing some simple act of kindness, such as offering to pick up groceries, um, fill a prescription, or just making a telephone call to see how they are doing at this time. The lesson for us here is that we are our brother's keeper. And it was the master teacher, Jesus, who said in Matthew 20, 22 verses 36 to 39, when asked by the Pharisee, a lawyer, and it says, Teach, teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. End of that reading. In the Science of Mind textbook, Dr. Ernest Holmes, the founder of this teaching, states, the two great commandments are to love God and our brother man. In these hang all the law and the prophets. Love is a complete unity with life, and we cannot enter this state unless we are in unity with all that lives, for all life is one, end quote. Friends, to love God alone is not enough, for this would exclude our fellow man. And to love our fellow man alone is not sufficient, for this would be too limited a concept of God. Dr. Holmes goes on to state, when we realize that God and man are one and not two, we shall love both. We shall love men as an expression of God, and God as the life principle in all." End quote. Nowhere is it more clearly demonstrated that we are our brother's keeper than in the parable of the Good Samaritan, a story with which you are all familiar, but which I feel to share this reading with you again. And this is from Luke chapter 10, verse 29 to 37 in the New King James Version, in the parable of the Good Samaritan. But he, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now, by chance, a certain priest came down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came upon him and when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring in oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. On the next day, when he departed, he took out two pence and gave them to the innkeeper and said to him, take care of him, and whenever and whatever more you spend, when I come again, I will repay you. So which of these do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And he said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. End of that scripture reading. Indeed, this parable speaks to us of the love we should have for our fellow man. This love is the support, the outpouring of spirit. It is a great transforming power which brings everlasting harmony. We are also told in the Gospel of John 
that he who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Love, says St. Paul, is the fulfilling of the law. We have seen that to love the law is to experience its corresponding action in our lives. The law can be said to love us and so, and so love through us in acts of goodwill towards all other persons. This we observe in the person who is happy in his or herself, both inwardly and outwardly. He or she is more tolerant and generous in their dealing with others. Irvin Seal, in his book, Learn to Live, a New Thought Interpretation of the Parables, in reference to the parable of the Good Samaritan, states, the great lesson of this parable, which the world seems somehow to forget, is, all, is that every turn we would do, we, it would be good, but we can't be good because we do not fulfill the law. We would love, but instead we find prejudice and hate intervening because we have not observed the law of our own minds and soul and fulfilled it within ourselves. He goes on to state that the parable also points to the fact that we are the true neighbors and whomever you come upon, whomever you meet, that wherever you meet them, anyone is in, who is in need is your neighbor. End quote. My friends, this we know that we are in these special times and the things that we are experiencing calls to us to be a little kinder and treat everyone we meet as our neighbor. And here I'd like to share an affirmation with you as you go through this week. Whomever I meet on the pathway of life is my neighbor. I am my brother's keeper. And I'll repeat, whomever I meet on the pathway of life is my neighbor. I am my brother's keeper. In my own experience, I can recall before my mother made her transition, when she had the stroke and was hospitalized for three weeks, when it came time for her to come home, I was busy retrofitting the house, putting in ramps and a hospital bed, and she needed a wheelchair because she couldn't walk. And I remember one of our members calling to ask me about my mom and how I was doing. And I said to him, she's coming home, I'm busy setting up the house, and she will need a wheelchair. And without even a thought, he said, so you have the wheelchair already? And I said, no. And he replied, come down to the office. I have wheelchairs. You can get one to borrow, and you can use it for as long as you need. I was stunned for a moment. You see, these, those are the times when we know how much the people in our lives and our church community cares. And you really appreciate those acts of kindness. They are unexpected blessings. And we can all think of ways in which we can help each other. In our center, in our community, by performing acts of kindness. And we have seen many examples of this, even as recent as one of our members who offered to have the doors and windows of the sanctuary repainted giving it a much needed facelift. In addition, our innovative teams coming out of our summit 2020 are working hard to craft a strategic plan for the temple and will be reaching out to you in the coming weeks, all geared towards connecting our community. My friends, we cannot outgive God as we continue to express love and perform these acts of kindness by giving of ourselves 
and our substance to each other, to our center and our communities, we must receive. This is the first and fundamental law of life. As stated in Luke 6, 38 in the New King James Version, give and it will be given to you good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put in your bosom. For with the same measure that you give, it will be measured back to you. Of course, we want to ensure that when we do these acts of kindness, we do not end up surprising ourselves, however, as happened at this travel agency. A travel agent stood up from his desk to see an elderly lady and an older gentleman peering in the shop window off at the posters showing the glamorous destinations around the world. The agent had had a good week, and the dejected couple looking in the window gave him a rare feeling of generosity. He called them into his shop and said, I know that on your pension, you could not afford to have a holiday. So I'm sending you off to a fabulous resort um, as my expense, at my expense, and I, don't, and I won't take no for an answer. He took them inside, asked them their name, gave them to the secretary and said, book two flights and a room in a five-star hotel. So as expected, they greatly accepted the offer and they were on their way. About a month later, the little lady they came back to his shop and he said, and how did you enjoy your vacation? He asked eagerly. The flight was exciting and the room was lovely, she said. But I have come to, I've come to thank you, but I have one question. And he says, what is that? She says, but who was that old guy I had to share the room with? <laughs> My friends, <laughs> I, <laughs> for us, I hope that we have no such unexpected surprises <laughs> when we do our acts of kindness. Our founder, Dr. Holmes, reminds us in our Science of Mind textbook, one of the first things to do is to love everyone. If you have not done this, begin to do so at once. Perhaps, he says people are dying for real fulfillment and for genuine friendship. We always welcome the man who takes the, who treats the world as, as his friend and loves it. End of that quote. So now, let us set our intention this week and perhaps going forward to perform some act of kindness for someone. Perhaps we could give ourselves a challenge to do five acts of kindness this week. And no doubt you may have heard this quote before, and it's one from Stephen Garrell, which says, I shall pass this way but once. Any good, any good thing, therefore, that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer it or neglect it, for I shall not, not pass this way again." End quote. And so here are a few suggestions that I'd like to leave with you for the coming week to get you started. And one, perhaps this week you may want to hold the door for someone as you go in and out of the store. Simple, but it will be much appreciated. Let another driver know when you are leaving a parking space. Sometimes it's so hard to find parking, even at the mall or the supermarket. Smile at everyone you meet. Yes, it will make their day. My friends, bring a welcome gift, perhaps to someone who's new in your neighborhood or even a new co-worker, it will certainly make them feel accepted. 
And if you take the public transportation, why not give up your seat for someone this week? Or you may pay the toll or parking for the car behind you. That would be a welcome surprise. Or give a verbal or written thank you note to a member of our frontline workers or our security forces, perhaps as you go out this week for your vaccines. Or simply call a friend, a neighbor, a member of our church community who you haven't heard from in a while. Check in on them. And then I'd also like to suggest that you may offer to run an errand for an elderly person, and they too will appreciate this gesture. My friends, you can also be kind to yourself. Leave a happy note on the bathroom mirror that says you are amazing. And finally, you may want to write a thank you note to someone who inspires you. It may be a good friend, a loved one, a minister, your pastor, anyone who has done something to inspire you in your life. Challenge yourself to do any of these or as many of these as you can this week. In closing, if we really want to commit to performing acts of kindness and connecting with our community, then we can also make calls taking into consideration during our daily quiet contemplations, as said in this quote by Jack Cornfield, from moments of stillness, the most skillful way to love and serve becomes clear. By stopping to listen, we connect with one another, and true community is born, end quote. My friends, here endeth the lesson, now begins the practice. Namaste.